I think it's important to understand why spirit created the reality. And the spirit created the reality to perceive everything from every perspective. So it, the goal in this life is only to experience and express. So you express yourself and you experience. And to do that, ego needed to be created. So in polarity, we needed to believe that we are separate so we could experience separation until we choose to be unified again, the path back to source. Which is, I don't believe that any religion is bad. I believe they can be weaponized, but I believe that every path to source is a good path. So ego wants to enhance its identity through association with an object. I have, therefore I am. Uh, these points come from Eckhart Tolle, mostly. Uh, I learned a lot from his book, The New Earth. So, if when we have something, we unconsciously create an emotional attachment to it. And if you have an emo emotional attachment to it, your ego is saying that this is a part of me. And that if I lose this, I will be less of me. And I started thinking, if you have nothing, then who would you be? Because you, if you can't have an emotional attachment to an object, then what are you? Like, what do you stand for? And I think it's more in what you stand for and how you treat people. Uh, so you can still value and care for things without an emotional attachment. And it just take, it can be as simple as acknowledging, oh, I, I have an emotional attachment to this, so I've, I've made this part of my identity. Like, my vehicle's on fire, and I'm not upset because I acknowledge my emotional attachment. It's like, okay, well, it's just a physical thing. I'm glad I'm all right. <laughs> uh, wanting is not wrong. It is structural in our ego. Ego will always want. It doesn't want the moment. It just keeps wanting. And fulfillment is short because the wanting is never full. And that's okay. Uh, it's ta You can talk to your ego. And it's not about beating yourself up for your attachments. It's about acknowledging it so you can grow. So ego grabs identities and mental concepts of ourselves. So not only physical objects, but it can be titles, it can be identities like I'm a fast driver and that's my identity and you can't take that away or whatever it is. There's an ancient practice of renouncing all your possessions. And if you renounce your possessions, but you begin to think relatively unconsciously I am above my possessions therefore I am superior that is the new identity that ego has grabbed onto and these identities will never stop it's just ego's structure and want and it's part of our progression is just identifying when we have those identities so when I had chronic pain uh, I was still working on the psych unit reading this book and I remember the day at work, because uh, I didn't really expect to be attacked by a book the way I did. <laughs> and uh, I had all this chronic pain. And in the book, he talks about we can grab on to our pain for sympathy from others. And it's the identity of the sufferer. And my pain didn't really make sense, and that's exactly what I was doing. I was feeding the victim within myself and the victim will never be full and the more you feed your victim the more it wants which I think pretty soon we're gonna stop promoting victim culture uh, it's just not a good mindset it's, it keeps you trapped and it makes you feel weak but we are not weak we just per perceive ourselves that way sometimes uh, so the attachment to the body will always lead to suffering but we are not the body. We are the awareness of the body. And we can embody being the divine observer of self. So uh, the idea is to express your divine nature in this life because we are all divine. And ego doesn't want to believe that. And worthiness is a huge step in that. Uh, people don't want to believe that they, are, they can be divine, but I believe everyone is possible of anything. And it's due to our divine nature. 
So ego is created by spirit to experience. There is no right or wrong in spirit's eyes, only free will, choices, and lessons. Our higher self is already unconditional love, and we have to embody it. So like I was saying, polarity was creating, created for experience. Just as spirit could not move because there's nothing to move relative to, you cannot perceive anything unless there's a perspective to perceive it from, which is why polarity exists. So there's nothing wrong with polarity. Uh, but we have to transcend it. And we, that starts with a practice of <laughs> diffusing the egos, uh, right or wrong, better or worse, black or white. So this is how I look at loving people unconditionally. So unconditional love is loving without attachment or expectation. You don't expect someone to change. You don't want them to be different. You just hold space, be in your divine self, loving them for who, however they want to express themselves. And any agenda you put on that diverts away from unconditional love once there's an agenda. When the agenda is only experience, it is unconditional love. Now, with the practice of that, self-love is very important too. So boundaries and if someone is abusing your energy, abusing you, tr mistreating you, you can unconditionally, just with unconditional love, put up a boundary like, hey, I love you, but I don't like you, so just, you got to be over there. Like, you know, you don't, love is not limited to hugging and kissing. I look at love as being the only thing that actually exists. So when the vet, pure light at the first formation of the Vesca Pisces is unconditional love. Just as, so this goes back to us being a rainbow of white light. That is, once we have all that functioning, we are practicing unconditional love within this level of reality. Does that make sense? I was starting to go on a tangent there. <laughs> um, so ego, uh, I look at a meditation practice of ceasing thought because when, as I said earlier, our thoughts and emotions are vibrations, tangible vibrations that come off of our being. And when those relatively low vibrations are coming off of us, the vibration or frequency of our higher self is unable to get to us. But quieting the mind and practicing unconditional love is how we embody the frequency of the higher self. So awareness to the body anchors you in the present moment and ego just does not want the present moment. It always wants something else. So a good practice for anchoring in the moment is feeling or visualizing. So if you, you don't ask the mind, but you just feel into your hand and you feel your, the pulse in your palm and your skin and the blood and your joints and your tendons and your fingertips. When you are not asking the mind, you are just feeling. You're not creating these vibrations off of your mind. You're just feeling. And for me, uh, it was, it still is sometimes really difficult to be without thought. Uh, but visualizing or feeling is a good step to that for me. Um, visualizing is an exercise for your pineal gland. And if you're trying to create an image as clear as we see with our two eyes in your mind's eye, it takes all of your focus and all of your energy is going to that. Um, and to me, that anchors you in the present moment. Because as soon as you start drifting off, the visualization goes away, at least for me. Candle gazing helps a lot. So you stare at a candle and then close your eyes and follow the dot and then make an image around the dot. And the eye exercise, I started this on the psych unit. And all it is is uh, approaching a conversation without saying I. So like, okay, I'm not going to talk about myself. And what that allows you to do is you just feel and you hear and you listen and you respond to somebody about them instead of waiting to respond about yourself. And it's, for me, it was 
it, it feels like a very profound practice in diffusing the ego and always want, and whenever you want to say I, it's your ego wanting to talk. And technically we never have to say anything. So uh, in, when I worked on the psych unit, the whole job was to talk to people all the time. Uh, you know, the homicidal suicidal ideation. And you can really connect with someone if you're just like, oh, tell me more about this. What about this? How are you feeling about this? Instead of, well, let me tell you about my story, which it's... Now, <laughs> as you practice this and acknowledge it in your own life, remember that it's not right to judge people when you hear a conversation of, well, I did this, I did this, I did this, because we've all been there and it's okay and everyone's favorite person to talk about is themselves. And that's okay. That's just how ego is programmed. It's structural. Almost there. <laughs> you guys are doing well, thank you. So, owning your power. Just as ego grabs identities, I look at the identity of spiritual as a temporary identity, just like anything else. So to me, if I say I am spiritual, which I don't say to very many people because it doesn't come across how I think about it, it only means that everything in my life has meaning, that I am willing to learn from everything I am experiencing. I am not better or worse than anyone, I'm just trying to learn from my own personal experience. Uh, so as everything we perceive is a part of our lessons, uh, it's also a reflection of self. And the biggest way we can learn about self is through our triggers. Now, I do not look at being triggered as a negative thing. I look at it, as I mentioned, an opportunity to heal. Uh, I'll keep going. So, this is where shadow work comes in. So, shadow work, to me, is using these lessons from the spiritual identity to identify the triggers within myself that are making me act in ways I do not want to act. Because we are completely capable of being happy and blissful within every moment. And these conditioned beliefs and these triggers within us from our traumas and experiences hold us back from that. But it doesn't have to be that way. The observer effect came from an experiment where they shot electrons through a box that nobody could see, nobody could look in the box. And then they did the experiment where somebody was watching, observing the experiment, and it changed the experiment. And that's where the observer effect comes from. Anything that is observed is changed. So if you're able to identify through your triggers a block within yourself, then you have already started dissolving that aspect of yourself, that trauma within yourself and healing it. Now the awareness, it's, it's tangible light. That's, your energy is electricity, it is light. And when you think of something, your energy goes there. So now there are many layers to these traumas within self. And like you may learn, oh, I reacted this way because of this childhood trauma and I healed that. Well, it doesn't mean you healed the core of that. There are layers to it, and you have to come back to it and continuously healing. It is just another spiral of nature. It takes time and work. So unresolved trauma is a frequency we carry. So when I mentioned it at the beginning, I said that it was a block within our nervous system. But that block in the nervous system is only our physical body that anchors through our other bodies. So, <clears throat> if, well, so that trauma is anchored through all our bodies, and we have to learn to transmute it. So transmutation within self is a powerful practice, and it can be done by creating gratitude for the thing that triggered you or the thing that traumatized you. And we do that by identifying how we grew from it. So I know this happened to me for a reason. This is how I grew from it. I am now grateful for that trigger. And being able to have gratitude is, a, is one of the highest vibrations we can have. 
as opposed to our victim energy of why did this happen to me? That's a low frequency and it will keep us in a low frequency if we let it. It can be hard to identify where we are identifying as a victim in our life, but the sooner you can practice it and start ripping those band-aids off, we all do it. Like, why am I stuck in traffic? Why would this happen to me? Even those subtle things are victim energy and that your DNA, your being, every level of you hears those thoughts and feels that frequency. Blaming others is another victim energy. So I do not believe in saying, even though I still do it sometimes, they made me feel this. No. I reacted that way because of the blocks within myself. And due to that trigger, I am able to heal that now. Taking the blame away from them and taking responsibility for my healing. That's part of transmutation. Uh, one thing I think about all the time is there's you're not obligated to react any certain way to anything, ever. And that could... I mean, happiness, sadness, there's no obligation to feel that way. So that is within self, and that's what self-esteem comes from. And we've all heard uh, people joke about self-esteem. Well, that's about you, so why don't you feel better about you? But it takes real work. It takes time to work on yourself. And it takes a lot of compassion for self. Like, if you had a trauma as a child that seems so insignificant, but it created this core belief within yourself of all these negative thoughts about yourself, you have to have compassion. It's, it's okay, and it, we've all been there. So every time, this helps me check myself all the time. If I have an emotional reaction to somebody, like, and again, they made me feel, I have just given them power over me. So they made me feel so they can control me in that way? No, no, no. I reacted that way because of things within myself that I'm ready to heal now. Responsibility is such a big part of our growth. And if we don't practice it, we will be held in that low frequency. <clears throat> 